Good evening and welcome to the first lecture of the Vikings. Uh, this is a history class on the Vikings and we'll be uh, going through 14 weeks of uh, different adventures along with the Vikings where they went everywhere in the world. And uh, today we'll start with an introduction and an overview. So this is lecture one. Um, lecture one will be about an hour and 20 minutes and then we'll have a break and uh, then we will uh, commence with lecture two. So each week we will do two lectures. That's important because later on when I tell you about the WebCT, you'll be able to access these lectures on our website. So let's start with the Vikings. And here is a picture of the Vikings. This is a kind of Viking self-portrait. So you can see how the Vikings like to think of themselves. And uh, you see them with these interesting little animal helmet hats and with their spears. And here is, here is a, a uh, human-like beast. It might be a berserker or it might be a, a man who has uh, taken on the form of a bear or a werewolf. And this is all part of Viking culture. Okay, my name is Sally Vaughn, and uh, I've been here at the University of Houston a long time, many years. My research specialties are St. Anselm of Canterbury and Normandy in England and the 11th and 12th century church. Uh, this is a list of the books uh, I've written mostly on Anselm and the Abbey of Beck and the Archbishopric of Canterbury and uh, Anselm as a teacher and as a politician. Uh, so Anselm uh, was actually an Italian who settled in Normandy and made his career in, Norman, in the Normandy of William the Conqueror and uh, crossed the channel after the conquest of England and became Archbishop of Canterbury in England. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And uh, I got interested in the Vikings because Normandy, when it started out, was a Viking foundation. Uh, Normandy, there was a colony of Vikings who settled there, and they settled around the city of Rouen in Normandy, and I'll show you where that is in, in just a moment. And then they spread out and conquered all of Normandy in a very Viking way. Uh, there's a lot of argument about uh, how Norman, uh, or how Viking the Normans were. Uh, the English who study the Normans um, like to think of them as becoming very French and very Europeanized, but more and more people are looking at the Viking origins of the Normans and also the Viking origins of the English, uh, the English nation as it developed. And, um, and so uh, Viking history is, is enjoying a kind of renaissance, you might say, a resurgence of interest and a lot more people are looking at it. Um, so the question was, how Viking were the Normans? And we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit. Uh, well, I've already answered my questions. What do you know about the Normans? I meant to ask you, who is the most famous Norman of them all? <laughs> who? Press, press your mic. <laughs> it's okay, it won't hurt. William the Conqueror? Right, William the Conqueror is probably the most famous Norman of them all. 
one of the things that got me interested in the Vikings is there's a, there's a very important chronicler of Norman history called Orderic Vitalis, and I have Orderic's name right here, Orderic Vitalis. And he wrote, he wrote a, a, a kind of secret history. And I say it's secret because there was only one copy of it. Nobody ever copied this. And uh, it runs to six modern volumes. It's just voluminous. It's huge history that he wrote of Normandy and everything that was going, that was happening in Normandy and everything connected to Normandy. And he knew so much about the Vikings. He knew everything that was going on in Scandinavia. And so that kind of got me interested in, in you know, the Viking connections with the Normans. And that's how I kind of got started on the Vikings myself, trying to track down maybe what they contributed to the Norman culture. Um, what do you know about the Vikings? As, as a kind of starting place, what, what do you think about the Vikings when you, when you say Vikings? What comes into your mind? <laughs> yeah? Uh, they were early seagoers, I know that. Good, yes, early seagoers. They built wonderful ships. They went everywhere in the northern hemisphere except Japan they didn't quite get that far but uh, in, in the northern hemisphere across the Atlantic they went everywhere what else do you know about the Vikings they ran a substantial slave trade they did they did they were great slave traders and in fact probably there was more mix of cultures from the slaves the Vikings traded than anywhere I mean they captured slaves everywhere they went and they not only enslaved them for their own use, but they sold them everywhere, too. Anything else you know about the Vikings? Yeah. They uh, began the Russian culture? Yes, they began. They, they, they founded the cities that eventually grew to be the Russian state. Mm -hmm. Anybody else know anything about the Vikings? You don't think of any, anything else when you think about them. Um, uh, well, how are they presented in Western Civ texts or medieval European texts? Go ahead. <laughs> they're presented as barbarians, basically. Okay, they're presented as barbarians. They're, they're the sort of these, this wild scourge from the north. I'm not sure that they didn't have a written language, did they? Uh, sort of. They had runes. They had runes, but, but it wasn't, they didn't write literature or history with it, or stories uh, with the runes. Uh, they wrote inscriptions uh, and formulas, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at runes and see what they did. Do any of you remember how they appear in the Western Civ or World Civ or, or um, medieval history texts? Haven't run across them there? Sometimes they don't appear at all. Sometimes they're not mentioned in, in the history books. Uh, sometimes they're mentioned as, as these wild barbarians who swoop in and attack everybody and loot and murder and kill, and then they disappear. And, and so, I mean, it's just like bizarre. So that uh, people have these stereotypical ideas about the Vikings, and uh, very few people really check to see what they were really like. The internet is sometimes worse. Um, <laughs> there are some wild sites on the internet that have all kinds of misconceptions about the Vikings. Well, what would you like to know about the Vikings? Anybody come in thinking, I really want to know a certain thing about the Vikings? No? <laughs> your, your minds are just open, open vessels waiting for all the knowledge to be poured in, right? <laughs> well, press your mic there, okay. Yeah, yeah press the, set, the whole thing, yeah, whole thing, yeah, yeah. What, Eric the Red, wasn't he a Viking? Yes. What was his father's name? Um, uh, you know, I can't remember right off the bat. I don't even know if, it's, if anybody knows. Now, we oh, maybe think about his son. What was his son's name? Oh, Leif Erikson. Oh. Leif Erikson was his son. Erickson. Yeah, yeah. The, that's a, a, um, a last name that Vikings tend to have, the, their father's name plus son. Yeah. So you're interested in Vinland and the, 
exploration of Iceland and the discover of the new world? Yes, I've seen some programs on like Discovery Channel. Where they, they talk about Vikings going in, I guess it was Iceland, mm -hmm. in that area, mm -hmm. and how they made a settlement there, but it didn't, it, I don't think it lasted too long. Oh, Iceland did. Iceland still exists today. Well, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was one settlement, uh, I think, where they actually showed them meeting Eskimos, or, or Indians that were descended from Eskimos. Eating I could them? be so way off. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 okay. I don't believe the Vikings were ever cannibals. <laughs> but no, they did, they explored meeting, eating. meeting. I thought you said eating. Okay, <laughs> yes. No, they did meet Indians, and there there are there are sagas that tell about their meetings with the Indians uh, in North America. Uh, the Greenlander saga tells about the Eskimos that they found in Greenland. Uh, the, uh, there, there was no one, in, well there were some people in Iceland, but, but they weren't natives to Iceland. There were some Irish monks in Iceland, just a very few uh, hermits that were there in Iceland before, they, before the Vikings settled in Iceland. So, uh, but one of the interesting things about the Vikings is everybody thinks about them uh, being, being so savage, and yet you know, the places they really settled were the empty lands. They didn't try to settle where people were <laughs> uh, to any great extent, except maybe Russia, but Russia was a little bit different uh, in, in the way they settled it. Well, let's take a, a, a bit of a look at the Vikings. Here we have a map, and uh, this, this shows where Normandy is. Uh, I was mentioning that Normandy was a place, and, and they first settled right around Rouen, which is a city right here, and all they, all they controlled was that little bit of it, and then they expanded to this whole area. And this is the homeland of the Vikings. And when we first start out with the Vikings, of course, they're not the countries of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark as they are today, but, but there was a whole amorphous sort of area that, that was not divided into countries at all. But here you can see them in the northern part of Europe. And um, this, is, this is Iceland. It's spelled, this is, uh, uh, the labeling on this particular map is, is written in Old Nor in Norse, so um, uh, that's why the names don't look quite so familiar. But here's Norway and Sweden, but, but they weren't countries at this time. We'll see how they develop. Here's one of the misconceptions about the Vikings. I mean, when you think of the Vikings, you might think, uh-oh, <laughs> you might think about <laughs> what, is this, what does this look like to you? This is Wagner's The Night of the Swan. This is the, the, um, the Ring Saga in Wagner. So, so we might think of the Vikings as being uh, uh, people of that sort of the heroic legends of the Norsemen. Or we might think of the Vikings in this way as these sort of barbarian warriors. This is a, a 19th century drawing. Uh, these are actually Gauls, but the Vikings are also portrayed in the same way as these, these sort of unclean warriors <laughs> who, or we might think of them as running around with these horned helmets. Can you imagine fighting a battle with a helmet like that and those huge, huge horns weighing you down? Well, the truth is they never fought battles in horned helmets. The horned helmets were only for religious ceremonies, okay? When they fought a battle, the Vikings were very practical, and so when they fought a battle, they had useful helmets, not helmets of this kind. So that might be a misconception. Somebody mentioned ships and uh, the use of ships. This uh, happens to be from the Bio Tapestry, which is a portrayal of ships, that the ships of William the Conqueror as they crossed the channel to conquer England, but they're exactly like the Viking ships. And when I was traveling in Denmark, um, everywhere I went at all the museums, they had the Bayou Tapestry there and pictures of those ships. So the Danes had just adopted these Norman ships as, a, as Viking and they assumed that they're Viking and they're just like Viking ships. The sail is the same and the, they carry their horses on board. The Vikings carried livestock everywhere they went. Um, and and the, the Normans, of course, carried their horses as they crossed ch the channel to conquer England. It's built like a Viking ship with this, um, um, uh, this way of clinker built, it's called, um, building of, of the sides of the ship and then, of course, the big um, 
figurehead at the front and at the rear and so this is this is essentially a viking ship and we'll see some we'll see some uh, um, real viking ships some some museum uh, quality ones as well but this is a nice picture of one and here is a figurehead that would be on on a ship uh, actually these figureheads were removable and um, can you think of the reason that they might have had the figurehead on the ship? Can anybody guess why they would put a figurehead on the front of their ship? Yeah. Scare away the sea monsters. Yes, well, kind of. Um, to scare away the, the, the spirits of the sea or the sea monsters. And when they came to land, they would take the figurehead off because they didn't want to scare away the good land spirits. So that's why it's removable. Okay. Here is a Viking woman, and uh, a lot of these pictures I took in Denmark in uh, uh, various uh, museums and exhibits. And uh, this, these, uh, this is the clothing that a typical Viking woman would wear, and we'll talk about uh, um, Viking men and women as they live in society, how, how people live in Viking society. Well, okay, let's uh, do a review of the books that we're going to read. Um, uh, there are how many required books? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven required books, but uh, three of them are very short, okay? <laughs> They're not as many as they sound like. Uh, there is a textbook, and this is by Elsa Rosedahl. And when I was in um, Denmark, come on in. <laughs> when I was in Denmark, um, uh, I, I went to a, a number of universities there and uh, uh, talked to some friends and scholars and I asked the Danes, you know, wh which is the best textbook that's out on the Vikings? And they said Elsa Rosedahl's book, okay, and part of the reason is because she's Danish. But one thing I discovered is that um, the Scandinavian peoples today have very different ideas about how you should write Viking history. Um, most of the sagas were written in Iceland, and so the Icelanders really like the sagas, and they think the sagas are very valuable and, and that they should be used a lot as a historical source. The Danes, on the other hand, are very disdainful of the sagas, and there's a saying in Denmark, one rune is worth all the sagas. So they just want to pitch the sagas out and not use them at all. Norway and Sweden are sort of halfway in between. I mean, they use the, the sagas with caution, and uh, they use the runes and archaeological sources as well, as, uh, and, and uh, the historical sources that mention the Vikings like the Danes do. So there is this sort of division of feeling within the Scandinavian world about what sources are really trustworthy. But nevertheless, I agree that Elsa Rosedahl's book, The Vikings, is a very fine textbook, and it'll give you a very nice overview of the whole period. So we'll read this rather quickly at the beginning of the course in looking at our overview. Okay, so we'll, uh, um, some of the cover, this is a used one, and so uh, the cover might look a little different when you go in the bookstore, but this is our textbook and we'll have our overview of everything. The second book we're going to read is by Thomas Dubois and it's called Nordic Religions in the Viking Age. And I won't show you the cover because it's black, it's just plain, but <laughs> um, maybe I can, sh no, I won't show you the title page. Um, but it is a, it is a very interesting book. Um, most people, or, or, or up until fairly recently, it seemed that people put uh, Viking religions in the context of Indo-European religions, and um, uh, the Indo-Europeans are uh, peoples who started out in the Caucasus Mountains, and we'll see in a moment where that is, and spread all over the Eurasian continent. Um, and so they tend to look at, at uh, the, the Viking religion as sort of unique in itself, but its affinities they see as being maybe like other Indo-European religions that we have records of, like the Persian religions or the Vedic religions of India, or the Celtic religions, or uh, the Germanic religions, and seeing those uh, similarities. But Tom Dubois 
does something quite different. He puts the Nordic religion in the context of the northern land and the northern environment, and I really like that. The neighboring peoples to the Vikings are the Finns and the Samis and the people who became the Lithuanians and the Latvians and the Estonians and the people of that area. And so what he wants to do is say that northern environment fostered a certain type of religion. So that makes an inter interesting comparison that we can do in that book and, and sort of look at both angles of the religion. And it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty, I'll, I'll give you in my lecture, I'll give you a lot of the, the hardcore details of the religion, but this one you have to kind of uh, dig them out. But it's a very interesting and readable book. Um, about half of it is about the Viking and the northern religions and how they're all related. And then, um, and then the last half of the book, or the last third of the book, is about the conversion to Christianity and how the Viking religion um, influenced uh, the Viking acceptance of Christianity. And so that's, um, that's a kind of interesting one. Along with the Nordic religions in the Viking Age, um, I picked this other book, Poems of the Elder Edda, and this is a um, primary source. It is, the Elder Edda is one of the oldest sources. It's, uh, it's poetry, and it tells about the Viking religion and the Viking culture. There, it, there's a whole string of different works in there, and let me, let me just give you a sample of, uh, of um, the most, one of the most interesting things I find in here are uh, the sayings of the High One. And um, this particular passage is also called the Wisdom of Odin. And let me read you some of the wisdom of Odin and see what you think about it. And, and give me your reactions to these and tell me what kind of high religious knowledge this is. Okay. At every doorway, what you have to do is look around you and look out. Never forget, no matter where you are, you might find an enemy. Okay, the wisdom of Odin. Let me give you another one. Hail to host, a guest is in the hall. Where shall he sit down? To please him quickly, give him a place in front of the blazing fire. There must be a fire for the frozen knees of all arriving guests, food and clothing for those who come over the hills to your hall. Okay. What kind of wisdom is that? Any, any, any reaction to that? How would you categorize that kind of wisdom? Practical? Practical, yeah. It's really practical advice about ha how to handle everyday affairs. It's not something like, what is the meaning of truth? or what is the meaning of beauty, or, or, or something of that sort. But it's very practical. Let me read you just another one. It takes sharp wits to travel in the world. They're not so hard on you at home. In the flicker of an eye, the fool is found who wanders among the wise. Okay, here's another one. Better to be careful than to boast how much is in your mind. When the wise come in, keeping their counsel, trouble seldom starts. Okay, these are little aphorisms about everyday life and how to carry out your everyday affairs. Okay, well that's uh, the wisdom of Odin, and so it's very practical everyday wisdom. It's not like magic or great philosophy or theology. And, that, and the Viking, that's what the Vikings were like. And there are some other lays that are stories about um, uh, uh, different things that go on among the gods. Uh, uh, here's one called The Insolence of Loki, and Loki is a, is a pretty interesting uh, uh, Viking god. I mean, he's sort of half god and half giant, but he's the trickster, and he lies, and he cheats, and he shape changes, and he's one of their gods. <laughs> so, I mean, that's pretty interesting. I mean, they have, they have gods that are not what we would think of as... Um, having the qualities that gods have. So this is pretty interesting. You can find out a lot about the Viking values and their society and their day-to-day -day, uh, kinds of um, uh, interactions as well as their beliefs about the religion. 
uh, there is no such thing as, as, a, as a kind of Bible. They don't have a Bible. And the, and the story of the religion is not coherent. You have to piece it together from a lot of different stories. So it, it's not a really coherent story that's, that um, comes easily to you. Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, works of the Vikings are the sagas. And uh, there are lots and lots of sagas, not hundreds, but tens, you know, and maybe, I don't know how many sagas there are total, but probably less than a hundred. But there are lots of sagas that you could read. And I will post on our website a list of all the sagas in print that you can find. Um, but I picked one for us to read, um, Ale Saga. This is called Ale Saga, and it's one of the most famous sagas. And um, it's about Ale's family and Ale as he grows up. And he's, he's very interesting uh, as a Viking hero and what the Vikings looked at and admired in in a person that they make a, a hero of a saga. Um, and the sagas are written in, in a very different way than uh, most literature is written. It's not, not the way um, literature is commonly written in, in the West or in the Roman or Greek tradition. But one of the things that makes Ale uh, an outstanding person is when he's uh, he committed his first murder at the age of six. He killed one of his playmates, and his mother's reaction was, oh, he's going to grow up to be a wonderful Viking. So, <laughs> so um, that gives you an idea of what Ale is like, and you can see him here ready to slash and kill people. Um, yeah, but you can see the interactions in the culture and, and how the culture works and what their values are in reading the sagas. They're fun to read and they're a quick read. I, I assigned this whole book for one week so you can read it fast. I mean, it, it, it goes fast. You can, you can get a lot out of it. The other saga I picked, oh, the first half of the class we're going to look at um, the Viking culture. We'll look at the religion and the society and, and, and the culture and um, uh, and the uh, technology and all of those things. And then the second half of the class, we're going to look at the uh, adventures overseas that the Vikings uh, um, engage in. And so for the uh, exploration of the North Atlantic, I chose the Vinland Sagas. And again, this is very short, a very quick read, but it, it um, is the record of the exploration of uh, the New World. And so we, could, we can read that to get an idea of it. Then the Vikings went virtually everywhere and they um, founded new societies. Someone mentioned they founded Russia. Uh, they founded a number of societies. Russian, Russia isn't the only state they founded, but it's an important one. So we have on Russia, a whole book on Russia, The Emergence of Rus, 750 to 1200. And this is a marvelous book. It gives you in great detail archaeological uh, sources, literary sources, historical sources, and um, uh, tracing uh, the foundation of Russia and the growth of Russia. And you can see the Viking state evolving before your eyes. And then an interesting comparison we can make is to another Russian state, uh, uh, another Viking state that was founded, and that is England. England, in fact, was conquered by the Vikings at least twice, maybe three times, if you consider William the Conqueror's uh, raid of England, the last great Viking raid. <laughs> but England was conquered for sure twice by the Vikings. The second time, uh, the first uh, time it was conquered, the, um, the result was Alfred the Great, who, who sort of came back and he didn't drive the Vikings out. What he did was incorporate them in England. So England was already a kind of Anglo-Scandinavian country at that point. Then we have a second conquest by Canute's father, uh, Svein Forkbeard. And Canute, Svein died quickly, and then Canute then took over England. And he became the king of England. But he was not only king of England, he was also king of Norway and Denmark. And so he was king of a North Sea empire, and, and England was sort of the crown jewel of, of the empire. And uh, so Canute is really interesting. This is a new book about Canute and his, and, and his rule in England, the Danes in England in the early 11th century. And so it's kind of interesting to compare these two books to see the two great 
kingdoms that the Vikings were um, really instrumental in, in, in founding and putting together. Okay, I, you know, I could have assigned many more books, but I resisted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could have given you some books on Normandy and Iceland, and there are so many that we could have done, but I, I tried to pick the best ones I could. Um, I did pick some optional books as well, and some of you, some people are interested in the history of women and Viking women, and there's a lot of new interest in Viking women. I think I ordered this book. I hope I did. I, um, if I didn't, you can know about it and order it. Um, Jenny Jockins, uh, Women in Old Norse Society, and I really, I really like this book a lot. It's a wonderful book. Uh, she really, she traces uh, all the history of women through all of the sources, and she does a very fine job of it. Um, women were surprisingly free and had a lot of privilege in Viking society. Uh, they were pretty equal to men. Uh, I, I found, I found it. Uh, quite enlightening. So this is an optional book. Um, another optional book is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And the, this is a big thick book. It's more of a, uh, of a reference book. Uh, you wouldn't want to probably sit and read it through, you know, <laughs> like a novel. It doesn't read like a novel. But the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles were begun in the reign of Alfred the Great, who conquered England, as, uh, who um, uh, um, uh, reacted to the Viking conquest of England by reorganizing England and sort of incorporating the Vikings into the English kingdom. And, the Ang and he started the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. And they really tell about the history for this whole entire period. They tell about, uh, uh, there are five different chronicles that are kept in different areas of England, and each one is slightly different. It's very local. So the northern chronicles tell a lot more about the Vikings because there were more Vikings in the north. And, uh, and so you can really read year by year what everyone in England is doing and when the Viking raids come and when the Vikings take over in Canute's reign and what they do. So this is a wonderful primary source if any of you want this one. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle doesn't come in print and paperback very often. So, I mean, if you're really into this history, now is the time to get it. Another one, and, and you'll have a paperback. This is a, this is a hardcover book that I have. It's the Encomium M.I. Regina. And this is a story about uh, Emma of Normandy. Emma was, uh, and you remember Normandy was a Viking settlement, and Emma was the daughter of Richard I, Duke of Normandy, and the sister of Richard II, Duke of Normandy. And what Richard I did was marry off his daughter to Ethelred Unred, King of England. And Ethelred was king when there were enormous Viking invasions. I mean, there were terrible raids constantly, and he paid them all off, and he had a really hard time fending the Vikings off. And it was in, in Ethelred's reign that, in fact, uh, Svein Forkbeard conquered England, and then he died right away. And then Canute came back a year later and took it over. Then Ethelred died. He fled to Normandy first, then he came back, then he died. And so what did Canute do to assure that he could be king of England? The first thing he did was convert to Christianity. The second thing he did was to marry Emma, the widow of Ethelred. So Emma of Normandy then, this Norman, Viking, Norman woman, uh, was married to an Anglo-Saxon king of England, and then he, she was married to Canute, the, the um, Norse king of England. And she was a very ambitious and very politically astute woman. Uh, she struck a deal with uh, Canute when she married him that if they had any children, her children would inherit. Canute was already married to somebody else, but um, actually he kept the first wife and sent her to Norway with her or with her son, and he became king of Norway. But he married Emma because she was his Christian wife, and so uh, Emma made a deal. She made him sign, you know, a deal that their their son would inherit England and not his children by by other marriages. Uh, as you can see, the Vikings were not necessarily monogamous. Um, 
So, so this is an interesting book because Emma commissioned it, and so you can sort of see her point of view. Uh, and and it, it's in paperback, so they just sent me a hardcover, but it is in paperback. Uh, the next book I still need to order, and I haven't done it yet because I couldn't find who published it. This is an old copy that, that is uh, in hardback, but it's newly out in paperback, and it's Columbia University Press. I just found my little... Uh, um, my little um, record of it, and it's Adam of Bremen's the the history of the Archbishops of Hamburg Bremen, and Hamburg Bremen was the um, archiepiscopal see uh, that was the jumping off place for all the missionaries to Scandinavia, and so here he has a lot about Viking religion and the missionaries as they try to convert Scandinavia. So it's a wonderful source on the Scandinavians as seen by the missionaries. And the missionaries came back and reported to Adam of Bremen and he wrote everything down about them. So I, I still need to order this book and, and, uh, and so I'll do that. Okay, office hours. Uh, uh, you need to check the syllabus uh, for office hours for me and for our uh, TA. But here is my email address. Uh, and so if you want to contact me, email is the best uh, uh, way to, to contact me. And your TA information is also on your syllabus and it's on our WebCT site. Okay, um, and, and I might mention the WebCT site. Uh, you, once you're registered for the course, uh, you can click on, you can get on the uh, U of H website and then you can click on distance learning and then that should take you through to the uh, WebCT. It's called WebCT. Let me write that down. Site and you need a password to get on but there's a tutorial there right online to help you get on uh, to that um, that website so that you can uh, type it us usually it's your birth date that you type in uh, uh, as your initial password and then you'll change your password on the WebCT site there's nothing on the site now but I'll, I'll be putting uh, things on as we go along through the course what I intend to do is to post the notes for every one of the lectures so that they will be on the WebCT site and you should be able to download them. Um, since I'm writing my lectures as we go along, you can probably try about 5 o'clock <laughs> on the day of our class. But for those of you watching on, on uh, Channel 8 on TV, they'll be on there several days early. Um, is so that you can um, download the lecture notes for each of the courses. There will also be a lot of other things like links to maps and we'll put some of our maps on the WebCT site. We'll put some articles on there and uh, uh, some other websites that are good. Um, the midterm is going to be on the WebCT. It's a take-home midterm and you'll be able to print it out and you'll have a week to do the midterm and then you'll um, and then you'll turn it in on the WebCT site. So uh, you should access that as soon as you can. All right. The Viking Age is 750 to 1000 AD. What defines the Viking Age? What defines it is the activity of Viking. And I'm actually pronouncing Viking wrong because the correct pronunciation is Viking. And it's not a noun identifying people or a person. It is a verb. Viking means adventuring, raiding, and trading, and going out and exploring. And um, it's an activity. Uh, the origin might be from the word for bay that, that has to do with sailing or going out by sea. But the areas of activity of the Vikings, and I'll call them Vikings because I just, I will forget and call them Vikings instead of Vikings, but the areas of activity are the North Sea, Scandinavia, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Russia, continental Europe, Normandy, Brittany, Frisia, Flanders, the Orkneys, Scotland, Ireland, England, the Shetlands, the Hebrides, the Faroes. Iceland, Greenland, Vinland, the Mediterranean, Byzantium, the Central Asian, 
trade routes and the Islamic world. So clearly they went practically everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. And here on this map you can see where they went. Uh, to the east they went to Russia and down the rivers of Russia to Byzantium right here in Constantinople. And over here they had contact with the Muslim world and the Muslim trade routes. Uh, can we see that? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then they went um, to the west. They first, they started attacking England and the continent, and then they attacked north of Scotland, the Orkney Islands here, and then around to Ireland and around this side of Scotland. Uh, they conquered England, as we already talked about. And then they used these islands across the Atlantic as stepping stones. Whoops. <laughs> Um, uh, from the Orkneys, the Hebrides are here, the Shetlands here, and the Faroes to Iceland, to Greenland, and across to Vinland over here, and Vinland is over here. And so they went in virtually every direction. I mentioned Normandy here as, as one of their areas that they settled in in Normandy. They also made significant raids into Brittany here and and Frisia and Flanders here. But then the Normans, once they were settled, they then not only conquered England, but they conquered Italy and Sicily, and then a lot of them went on the Crusades and conquered the Crusader states. So uh, there's just an enormous impact of the Vikings on the whole world. As I said before, the first half of the class up to the midterm is on Viking origins, society, culture, religion, sagas, art, and artifacts technology and home life, and we'll have the lectures and uh, the notes, maps, and resources on the website. There will be a midterm and a final, as I said, up to the midterm. There will be a project for the course, which will be a research paper on one, on, on one of many different topics. Uh, I want you to write a project proposal to turn in the week before the midterm is due so that you start your research and you get ready to do your research uh, and, and get started on it early. Uh, there is a list of topics on your syllabus and you can choose one of those topics. Um, here is your syllabus that shows uh, the um, uh, the first half of the course up to spring break when the project proposal is due. And I didn't put the list of uh, the of the syllabi there, uh, the list of the topics. Uh, but the topics can be virtually anything. You can do Viking England, uh, one, or, one or more of the different conquests. You can do Viking women, Viking religion, society. Uh, there's a huge list of topics that you can do. Um, or if you don't see anything on that list that appeals to you and you have another idea, you can email me or RTA and, and say, ask us if it's okay and we'll let you know if that, if that, will, that topic will be all right. Uh, so we want you to um, uh, look at those. And let me give you some ideas about it. Uh, here are some really interesting things, pre-Viking uh, history before we have written records at all, are these hill carvings, these rock tracings that are on hills that, that are just carved records that, that show what Viking society is like. And um, they're very, very interesting. And um, uh, um, you know, archaeologists are trying to figure out exactly what they are. Here, here's another uh, view, another one, uh, part of the rock tracing that shows the different things. And one of the first things we see is um, uh, that they have ships very early, even before they're, they're out on the sea. Uh, and and they, they're, before they're Vikings, uh, before 750, they have a lot of ships in their, in their very ancient age, and they're on the ships. They have a lot of animals. Can you tell what some of those animals are? This looks like a duck or a goose. Might be a goose, I think. These look like dogs to me. I think they, the Vikings were the earliest people that we know of to domesticate dogs. They domesticated dogs very early. And they might be, uh, they, they might be horses or deer. They look like these look like chickens and ducks, and geese. This might be a horse, but these look like dogs to me. <laughs> anyway, 
and ships, of course, uh, the Viking ships and the adventures overseas. Uh, this is another Viking ship. Um, uh, the uh, adventures, their conquests, wherever they went, or their society, the kind of society they had. They had a military society that might be of some interest to some of you to write about or research. Uh, here are some of the weapons, iron spear points, and these have runes on them. This is a rune stone um, that um, uh, they left. Uh, they left rune stones everywhere. Runes would be an interesting thing to do a research topic on to see what the runes uh, meant and what they were doing. Uh, here are some symbols of Viking religion. These are all Thor's hammer, various uh, uh, representations of Thor's hammer. Thor, of course, was the uh, the god of thunder and lightning, and so his hammer struck the lightning. So religion is something you could do. Uh, Viking art. Uh, art. The art is very interesting. It's very original art. Um, it's kind of like Celtic art, and, and sometimes it's like um, Germanic art, but, but then um, once they diverged into their Viking culture, it became very original and very unique. So we will talk about art in this class, but that, that would be an interesting topic to do your term paper on. Um, part of the art is metalworking, and the Vikings were just superb metal workers. They were so good at metalworking, and you can see that this metalwork is just gorgeous, gold and silver with a kind of interlace and these swirls that are typical of Viking art. And um, this is just barely scratching the surface of, of the kinds of things that they could make and that they habitually did make. There are hundreds of artifacts like this that can be found. Uh, Viking tools, uh, here are some of their metalworking tools, but uh, they, were, they were master craftsmen working with with metal, uh, whether it was iron or gold and silver, or making swords or making tools. And so here are some of the tool making, um, uh, uh, or the tools for uh, working the iron, actually. Uh, these are pinchers and tongs. Uh, some of you might be interested in Viking culture. How did they live their lives? Anybody know what these are? Can you guess what they are? Drinking horns, right? That's exactly what they are. The Vikings drank out of horns, and they were—they started out being, I mean, you know, sort of cattle horns, so that they they could drink. You know, I think you can't actually set the Viking horns down because they had to drink it all in one draft. <laughs> and well, I, I guess the the cattle horns weren't big enough for them, so they ended up making these gigantic drinking horns, and, I, and they passed them around. That's why they're so big. But these are magnificent ones in the in the National University in Copenhagen and uh, uh, I, when, we, when we get to their society I'll show you what all these carvings are on the side and, and, and they're showing Vikings partying and drinking lots of beer and ale <laughs> in their drinking horns um, they had a they had a good time that you you know I don't have it on the list but if anybody wants to do Viking sports or Viking pastimes um, they played chess, and here is a huge collection of chessmen. This, again, is from the National Museum in Copenhagen. And um, uh, they love to play chess. It's a strategy military game of conquest, of course. You all know that. And so they, they carved all these chessmen, and they played chess a lot. But the Vikings were great sportsmen, and they had wonderful sports. And if you read through the sagas, you can find different um, different depictions of the sports that they had. So nobody's ever written a paper on that. That would be a very interesting research paper for someone to do, Viking sports or Viking pastimes, what they did for fun and entertainment. That would be a, a, a good term paper for somebody to do. Um, uh, how did the Vikings live? This is a model of Viking houses. These are long houses, and they, they lived communally, uh, not in single families. They lived in houses like this. And, and we'll, we'll get into some detail about what their houses are like and what their culture was like. But, but their everyday life, that would be something else that somebody could write a term paper on. So you have lots and lots of choices, and we're being very... Um, we're being very, um, you know, flexible about what you can do. We want you to do what you're interested in, 
doing for your research paper to find out as much as you can. Okay, now we've finally come to the list of topics that are down here, but now we've gone over them already. Uh, at, at the very bottom here, you can see uh, all the different uh, uh, topics you could get. You, you could also do some of the individual Viking kings who are very interesting, like um, Harold Hardrada, who ranged all over the Mediterranean and ended up attacking England and trying to conquer it before William the Conqueror did. And he served in, in, um, in the Varangian Guard in Constantinople, and he raided the whole Mediterranean. Um, very interesting guy. Or Yaroslav the Wise, who was one of the greatest kings of Russia. Very interesting person who, in, in, in his lifetime in the 11th century, was probably the greatest king in all of Europe <coughs> at, at that time. And so there, there are some interesting individual kings that you might want to do uh, your research paper on. Um, any any questions or comments about the research papers? Um, I'll give you a little bit more information about them. Your term project for your research paper should be uh, 20 pages long. At least 10 of the 20 pages should be written text, and the rest can be illustrations and maps and charts and so on. Uh, we want you to use at least six sources for the text, four of which should be books or articles. Um, uh, the internet is great, except it's very dangerous. <laughs> Two may be internet sources, but the Vikings are very romantic and very mythologized. And so if you get on the internet, you might find a lot of junk. You have to be very careful. The best clue to whether it's a good site about the Vikings is, is it, if it's got the address edu in the address, it's a United States uh, university, and so it's okay. And that's the best clue. If it's a foreign university in Denmark or in Norway or in Sweden, um, or, or if it's a museum or a library, uh, then you're, you're safe if you have any of those sites. But there are a lot of people out there who do this sort of reenacting of battles and things like that. And um, you, you don't know whether they're accurate. I mean, you would have to check up on them to see if they're accurate. They're not a really good source. So you have to be careful. Um, for your maps and illustrations, you may use any sites. You don't have to use uh, 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 any sources. You don't have to use only books uh, or websites. Uh, but you have to footnote them as if they were uh, as if they were a book. Or I mean, you have to footnote everything. Um, don't use general encyclopedias like Americana or Britannica or Compton's or any of those. Those are for high school students. You're beyond that now. Uh, there are some encyclopedias you can use. You could use specialized encyclopedia like uh, Encyclopedia of the Scandinavians, uh, Encyclopedia, uh, the Dictionary of Medieval History, that's a really good one. If it's scholarly and it's done by scholarly people, then it's okay, and usually those are shorter works. I mean, the, but the huge encyclopedias for high school students you don't want to use. Also, do not use Will and Ariel Durant's Story of Civilization. That's very old, it's completely out of date, and nobody can write a whole history of the world and know everything about it. I mean, it's just really out of date, so don't use that. Don't use Western Civ or World Civ or medieval textbooks. Textbooks are usually behind the times. Uh, if you wanted to know the very latest cutting edge research, where would you go to get it? Periodicals, exactly. Journals, scholarly journals. That's where you get the cutting edge research that's going on. So that's that's your best source. And uh, uh, here are some encyclopedias that are allowed. Uh, the Dictionary of Medieval History, the Cambridge Medieval History, the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, you may also use your assigned and optional books for the course a a as well. Uh, you can use these books that, that I've assigned as some of your sources. Um, a guideline for the term project will be posted on the website and will show you how to do the proper footnoting and bibliography uh, for the maps and illustrations as well as the sources. And we will also put a list of journals with their call numbers on the, on the website so that you can look at those. 
Okay. The project proposal that's due at the midterm should be at least two pages of text, but not more than five, and one page of bibliography. And on your bibliography, I want you to find every book you possibly can and list it. You don't have to check it out of the library or order it. You just have to list it. I want you to just see what's out there, what is available, and do a, do a really full bibliography. And you may or may not use all the books that are on your bibliography. Uh, you should have done at least some reading and thinking in order to write your, your project proposal and, and try to outline the questions that you want to investigate in your project proposal. And we just want to see, we want you to be a little ways along in it so we can check your project proposal and make sure you're on the right track. And we want to see your sources to make sure you're, you're using good sources. Okay. And, and usually when I grade them, I go through and I mark which are the good sources and which are not good. And obviously the newer the books are, the better your sources are. I mean, if you're getting books published in 1850, they're not going to be up to date, are they? <laughs> so you want to get your new ones. You might discuss how you arrived at the questions you're going to investigate. Uh, so your bibliography should not be limited to only the books you've got in your hand. But what are the possibilities? Well, how many books can you find on the topic and list? You don't have to get them, just list them. Okay. You also need to divide your bibliography into primary and secondary sources. Do you all know the difference between primary and secondary sources? Yeah. Primary sources are written by the people at the time we're talking about. Examples would be the sagas. They would be primary sources. Okay. Adam of Bremen would be a primary source. Um, uh, secondary sources are written by modern auth authors. Okay. On the WebCT site, we'll have the published so a list of the published sagas and a list of the relevant journals. Um, you'll have the take-home midterm exam on the WebCT, and you'll have one week to write it. Uh, the midterm will have two parts to it. Part one will be map identifications. Okay, what we'll do is post a blank map on the website and we will have numbers on it, probably in color so that you can tell what they are. But we'll have 12 numbered sites and then you need to identify and tell the significance of 10 out of those 12. And this would be like only about a third of a page or half a page you would want to write for your short essay. Part two will be one essay and you'll have a choice of one out of three. We'll give you three different questions and you choose one to write your essay. And the, um, the essay questions will be on the assigned books and they might be a comparison. One thing I've already suggested is we can compare the Russian culture to the English culture. Okay, there's an exam question right there that we could ask possibly. Uh, compare Anglo-Saxon England under Canute to um, Russia under Yaroslav or whatever we, we want to say. Uh, so it'll be on the on the readings, um, and there and you'll have a, a limit. We'll probably say I don't know how many pages, five or six for your essay. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a page limit for that, and that'll be turned in on the Web CT. And there's a way to do that, a fancy way to do that that our TA is working on. Okay. The second half of the course will be on the Viking adventures overseas, the places they went and the raiding and trading and exploring and conquering and colonizing and state building both at home and abroad. And we'll kind of end with conversion to Christianity. Once they convert to Christianity and they build the states that become Denmark, Norway and Sweden, which are European states, they're not Viking anymore. They stop doing their viking, so they're not Vikings anymore. Okay, uh, as I said before, we'll have lecture notes. We'll have some timelines for this period. I have, I have timelines for the invasions of different parts of the world, of Europe and Britain and Iceland. Uh, and I have genealogies of the l ruling families and the kings of the various things. All of these will be on the website, plus links to museums and university sites. And here we can see our lecture schedule, and the second half here is will be on... We, we sort of start by looking at their ships and weapons that they use to... Uh, 
to conquer everything and, and go everywhere, and then, and then we go through uh, their conquests one by one. Okay, for a little overview here, here is a ship, uh, a Viking rendition of one of their ships, a very typical ship. And here again is our map of all the places they went, and we'll look at them one at a time. We'll look at, we'll look at the invasions in Europe and, and the Orkneys and Ireland and Scotland and Russia and Iceland, Greenland, Vinland, England. Normandy, okay, and that ranges, and, and, and we really start, interestingly enough, there is a, a, um, a kind of um, Scandinavian invasion of England a couple hundred years before the Viking Age, because the Angles and the Saxons originally came from Denmark, which is very interesting, and in fact, it's quite interesting that they came and they settled and sort of intermarried with the Celts or pushed them out uh, uh, of England. It used to be called Britain. It's named England after the Angles who settled there. And then their language became predominant so that when the Vikings invaded England, they could understand the Anglo-Saxons who lived there. They spoke almost the same language. <laughs> so, I mean, they're the same people. It's, it's really quite interesting. Um, and then uh, uh, here is Russia. Here is a map of Russia as it was settled. Um, and not only Russia, but also this area of uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and the Lets. And um, Lithuania was never conquered, but the Lets and the Kurland and uh, Prussia was influenced, and Finland and Lapland and all of that area. All of this was settled by the Vikings as, as they came that way. Ireland, of course. Ireland was nothing but a mishmash of little warring tribes. I mean, it became a, a, an organized state because of the Viking raids. There were no cities in Ireland before uh, the Vikings came. They founded all the cities. Uh, Dublin and Cork and Waterford and and Cashel and and uh, all of the famous cities of Ireland were founded by Vikings. They were Viking uh, trading posts. Iceland. We'll go into great detail on Iceland on the settlement. We have the eastern settlements over here, and the western settlements over here. And here is the northern part. Um, so we'll go into great detail on Iceland, which is one of the most interesting Viking. Um, uh, colonizations. And then from Iceland we'll go to Greenland and look at the settlements in Greenland, which uh, in Iceland they settled all over these coasts and even in the north here because, you know, the Gulf, the Gulf Stream goes by there and, and kind of warms it up. Greenland, which is not green at all, but which is a glacier, <laughs> it's nothing but a sheet of ice, and they only managed to settle in the very south, but they explored all the way to the North Pole, practically. They explored all of Greenland. It, they were amazing explorers. And if you stood on the top of a mountain in Greenland, you could actually see North America. You could see North America. Yeah, question. Was Greenland green at any time of year? Or were they just being facetious or what? And it was a propaganda move. Actually, Leif Erikson named it Greenland because he wanted to attract settlers. He lied. You know, it was just like putting an ad on TV. You want to put, you want to put the best shine to it that you can. And so he he called it Greenland so that everybody would think it was a wonderful new place. So, uh, and he got some settlers there, but never very many. Uh, uh, Greenland didn't last very well. Didn't last very long. Um, uh, England, England, as I told you before, England was conquered uh, at least twice. Uh, this area is the Dana Law. It's called the Dana Law because it operated under Danish law, even though it was part of Alfred the Great's kingdom. Eventually, uh, uh, this is Alfred's kingdom, but then he, his sons and grandsons incorporated the Dana Law. This area of England was actually under Viking control. This is Northumbria and this is Strathclyde. Um, 
strath I mean, both of them were nebulously part of Scotland, part of England. I mean, both of them claimed it, but the Vikings were just all over Scotland. The Wales, the Wales was never conquered. Can anybody guess why Wales was never conquered by the Vikings? Anybody ever been to Wales? Yeah, what is Wales like? It's really lame. <laughs> It's full of high mountains, and there aren't any cities there, and it's just, it's, it's very cold, very cold, icy, glacial mountains. It's, it's not a very hospitable place, and so uh, the Vikings weren't very attractive there. Um, and, and the Normans eventually conquered part of it, but, uh, but it was the last place to be conquered. I mean, England, there are other places much better in England than Wales. Scotland is kind of harsh and forbidding too, but the Vikings were there because they, it was so close. Uh, the Orkneys, they were at, in the Orkneys, and here you can see this, this map of England and Normandy, um, which William the Conqueror conquered. And uh, uh, actually, the Vikings settled all along this coast because it was like home. Look at all those fjords. I mean, that was, <laughs> they were familiar to them. And the Orkneys is right at the top of here. It's just off this map. And, uh, and so they had this huge base in the Orkneys from which they worked downward into Scotland. And then, they, and then the settlers here uh, sort of cross-pollinated. And so they worked their way downward, challenging the English kings even for dominance and the Hebrides of course they dominated the Hebrides and then across and then they had Ireland I mean they, they just had so much of this area it's quite amazing uh, in Europe itself um, they went down all the rivers of Europe any river was a Viking highway and uh, in Germany, the Germans, uh, at that time, the Ottonian Empire was fairly strong, and, 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 and they were able to kind of hold them out of Germany. But Flanders, Frisia up here, Frisia, and Flanders, and Normandy, and Brittany were just overrun with Vikings. Everybody, the, the Flemish either drove them out or intermarried with them. That story is not told yet, and, and, and we need a graduate student to do a dissertation on that topic, on early Flanders and Frisia, because <laughs> nothing is written about it. Brittany, likewise. The Vikings were all over Brittany, and they founded cities, and, and the Britons, uh, as I read the sources, the Britons didn't drive them out. They intermarried. And that's what I think happened in Flanders and Frisia, too. I mean, you know, I haven't done a, a precise study on it, but it looks to me like that's what's happening. In Normandy, they stayed. They stayed and expanded themselves. And actually, the Normans conquered Maine and Brittany, and, and they had very strong allies with the Flemish. Uh, the Vikings tried to conquer Spain, but the Muslims were too strong and drove them out immediately. I mean, they, they just gave up on Spain because uh, uh, the, the, the government was too strong and it was too well defended. Mostly the Vikings went to places that were empty or were not very civilized and not very well defended. They took the easy route and they bypassed the strong people who defended themselves. So that's kind of the way it went. So here is the Viking world. Uh, we, we really can't include Vinland in the Viking world um, at that time because um, they, they just did these sort of minor forays. They couldn't get a, a grip on it. It was too far away and there weren't enough of them. Uh, so so they, they tried really hard, but they just couldn't make it in the New World. It's an interesting story, though, to see what it is. So here is the Viking world, and you can see that it had a huge impact on all of Europe. Uh, the term project is due about the last week of class, and again, see your calendar on the Web CT and your syllabus. Uh, the final exam will be about 10 days later. Again, check your calendar for the exact date. Um, and uh, we should be able to get all of your term projects graded to give them back to you at the final exam. That's the plan.
so that you'll, you'll have a real good idea of how you're doing in the class at that time. The final exam is exactly like the midterm, only it's on the second half of the course. Okay. Um, any questions? We have seven minutes left. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you kind of tell us what the point value of the, the test and the project are? Oh, it's real easy to figure out. 25% for everything. <laughs> okay. Your project, your proposal counts as much as the project itself. So your project proposal is very important that you do a good job on that. Mark that in your brain right now or mark it on your syllabus because it counts 25% and so does your final project. So, you know, you have to do a good job on that proposal. Think of it as stage one of your term project. Another question. Yes, the, you said the final only covers the second half of the class. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, question. Press your mic in front of you. Do you know if the uh, Emerge of the Rust is still in print? They told me at Rothers it wasn't in print still. They told you it wasn't in print. That's interesting. Uh, did, did, it, did you get it at the UH bookstore? Okay, good. Good. Okay, uh, it should be in print. It's pretty new. I mean, I can't imagine that it would be out of print already. But you know, publishers do weird things. Um, any other questions? Which do you think is the most interesting looking? Oh, well, we have a question off campus. Yes. Um. Here. You don't have a syllabus. Okay, where are you? Sugarland. Sugarland. Okay, in Sugarland. Oh, I didn't even know we had anyone in Sugarland. Um, I will have the syllabus on the WebCT site tomorrow morning. Okay, and you'll be able to okay. download it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other off-campus students? Uh, we should have some people in, uh, we, we have Sugarland. we should have some people in the Woodlands. Do we have anybody in the Woodlands? Do we have someone in the Woodlands? No? How about um, West Houston and Katy? Do we have anyone? Cinco Ranch? Hi. Hi, excuse me. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, we can. West Houston? How many okay, of you? Question. Yes. Question. Um, we know that Reed Erickson, in fact, uh, set foot on Vinland and made it as far as the Great Lakes. Why then do we credit uh, Columbus with uh, discovering the continent? Well, not everybody co uh, credits him with discovering it. <laughs> Leif Erikson discovered it. And in fact, if you, go through, if you go through the chronicles of the 12th century, like Adam of Bremen, remember I mentioned Adam of Bremen was writing in 12th century um, uh, Germany. He knew about the, the New World. There were maps of it floating around. People knew about it. You know, I read somewhere that Columbus actually went to Norway to study. No, he went to Norway to study with them, the yeah, to get the inside track. Um, uh, so it's this Western Civ mentality of writing the Western Civ books, and, and, and the Italian Renaissance glorifies itself so much. You know, they don't want to give credit to anybody. <laughs> they were the ones who labeled Europe the Dark Ages before the Italian Renaissance. It's nothing but propaganda. <laughs> How many of you are there in uh, in West Houston? Four of us today. There are four of you. Four of us currently, yes, ma'am. Oh, good. There. Oh, there you are. I see you. Great. I can see you on the. Uh, yes, I see you on the monitor. There are four of you. I only have three on my list. That is terrific. Would you all please sign your name on a list, and would one of you take charge of uh, emailing me the list tomorrow morning? Would one of you volunteer to do that? Sure. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, email me the list of people who are there, 
And I hope all four of you will come every week because you need to make great friends with each other so you can have discussions with each other about what's going on during the break. And please add email addresses to the list. Oh, and please add email addresses. Our TA says we need email addresses on your list that you send me tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vaughn? Yes. Uh, we don't have a syllabus out here in West Houston. Uh, I know you don't. It's because I didn't send you one because I forgot. But uh, <laughs> it's going to be on the website tomorrow morning. And you should be able to go on the web CT and download it tomorrow morning. Is that okay? okay great, thanks. Good. Okay. okay. Good. Any other questions on our off-campus sites? I'm sorry I didn't call on you sooner. In the future, if you want to interrupt the lecture at any time and ask a question, please feel free to do that. And that's true of people in the classroom as well, although I think we have a kind of shy class in our classroom. But if you have a question, uh, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, usually I allow time. I allow plenty of time for questions, and it can be during the lecture or after the lecture. Right now, we're going to take our normal break, and it'll be about mm, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, about 10 only, t only 10 minutes tonight. Okay, normally we'll have 15 to 20, but only 10 minutes tonight. I know. <laughs> but only 10 minutes tonight, and when we come back, we'll have our second lecture, Lecture 2, which you can download the notes on tomorrow off the website. Okay. So let's go ahead and take our break.